Hi, good morning everyone, and uh, I'd like to thank Angela and Katie and everybody on the team here for putting together another fantastic event. Um, I hope everybody had fun in getting to actually go to a castle last night, and uh, I enjoyed uh, when I googled it seeing the pictures of uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Barack Obama having uh, dinner there uh, just, I think, a couple months ago. So uh, if we could just have a quick round of applause for them for putting together uh, what I think has been a, a really well-organized. So I just, uh, we'll try and keep this um, relatively brief, but I did want to give you uh, kind of my history of the cloud and how I uh, perceive this. Um, before I start, I'll just give a quick uh, overview of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. We're actually less than a year old. We're one of the very newest projects of the Linux Foundation. Uh, we're best known for Kubernetes, which is the uh, orchestration and scheduling platform for containers. It was donated by Google to CNCF, um, and Google remains the, the biggest contributor to it, but we now have uh, tons of community support, uh, also from a lot of big companies and committers from a lot of other companies. And um, I'm pleased to say we've also now added in our second project, Prometheus, which uh, actually got started right here in Berlin. And if you do have a few minutes uh, later today, I would encourage you to go by the CNCF booth uh, where we have several of the Prometheus uh, core committers and um, they can show you a demo of that and some of the other work. This is a, a really uh, powerful platform for uh, watching your distributed system and uh, measuring it and uh, tracking how things are going. And it uh, seems like it's becoming something of a standard for many different components to interoperate with. So CNCF has its own board. We have an, these platinum members listed here. We are actually up to another 50 members and we're growing fast. Um, over the next six months, uh, hopefully you're going to see us add in another half dozen or more projects. And what we're trying to do is build uh, a set of open source stacks that allow people to um, build a complete cloud uh, uh, solution that can work on multiple different clouds and across clouds. And I'll talk more about that. But first, let's just go back in history a little bit to uh, the year 2000 where when you wanted to build a new application, in most cases, the building block was a physical server. You needed to call up uh, your sun salesman and say, please send me one. And it would often take weeks or months to get one. Sometimes if it was a big application, you would buy a rack of physical servers. Uh, my first startup was an internet uh, e-commerce company back, way back in 1994 that set up the first music store on the web. We uh, used used uh, deck Ultrix boxes that we had under our desks in a house in New Hampshire. But it was the same idea. When you needed more capacity, you just added on a new box. Um, so this worked great, especially for Sun, especially in 2000. They were selling loads of these things. Um, and so then our next stop in our, our history tour is VMware. And they had the, the relatively brilliant idea of virtualizing that server so that each application could have its own virtual environment and you could have multiple different applications sharing the same physical server. Now, and, and this is really based on the not so well kept secret that the vast majority of servers in the world are running at well less than 15% utilization. I've heard statistics from some enterprises of 8% or even 3%. And so the idea is that if you can uh, virtualize it, you can pack a bunch of different VMs onto the same machine. And now when you want to run a new application, you don't need to buy that new server. You can just spin up a new VM. So the architectural building block became a VM, although it was still relatively heavyweight, had its own complete operating system uh, unique for that application. So now we jump forward to 2006, and um, my, uh, my next speaker will be Chris Schlager from uh, uh, from AWS, who really, you know, AWS totally revolutionized the, the world here by saying, uh, and I'll say by popularizing, there were a few others before it, this concept of IaaS that you don't need to buy your servers anymore, you can rent them by the hour. So um, this capital expense, when I was a venture capitalist, we used to say, oh, it was you know, a couple million dollars to buy all those servers. Now it's just a few thousand dollars a month to rent them. You don't need to buy the capacity until your demand is actually there. Uh, but the building block of what it meant for, as you were building each part of your application 
didn't change that much. It was still a virtual machine. It just changed its name from a VM to an AMI, but it's still basically the same thing. And then uh, the last stop on uh, the proprietary side of our tour is a company in Her uh, called Heroku in 2009 that had uh, a huge impact, I think, in helping people understand how much better developer processes could be. And the idea here was that if you followed a set of relatively clear rules uh, called a t building a 12-factor application, um, that you could uh, deploy your application into their paths without having to think of all of the details about operating systems and versioning and keeping things up to date and you didn't necessarily need to hire the op, op staff and the DevOps staff. And there is this magic when you're first learning it and you say, oh, okay, I've made these changes to my app and you can just type git push Heroku and about 60 seconds later, that new version of your application is up live on the web. And so um, I think, uh, and. Heroku really had a, a massive impact on the industry about thinking about uh, trying to abstract away a lot of those uh, details. Now, often as with guide rails and other sorts of areas, um, it, it can constrain more than people want, want it to. But uh, for getting started, it's absolutely fantastic. Okay, so now we go to our next step in our history, 2010. And interestingly, the next four stops are all in the open source world. So you had uh, this consortium OpenStack startup, uh, originally uh, Rackspace and NASA, but it now includes uh, most big computer companies. And they said, could we go compete with AWS and VMware? Could we create an alternative uh, to those platforms that's completely open source that anyone can make use of. And I think looking backward, we could say, oh, okay, maybe this took a little longer for them to, uh, to build than they thought it would. Maybe it was a little clunkier in different ways or a little harder to install. But at the end of the day, they, they were successful. They have a platform that people can install and work and does create a viable uh, IaaS competitor that is uh, it offers this sort of EC2 VM competitor. It, it allows you to do uh, virtualization. But the key thought is that the building block of what OpenStack offers is still very much based around a VM. So then we, the next year, uh, Pivotal provided a uh, service called Cloud Foundry that they open sourced several years later, and that foundation actually lives next to ours in the Linux Foundation. They have an open source project that anyone can use and contribute to, and um, that's been uh, relatively successful in saying that this PaaS concept, this 12-factor app, you don't have to just use Heroku. There's now a number of other platforms that uh, basically give you the same capability. And uh, um, mainly offered by, by other companies. Okay, so now we jump to 2013. And we had uh, Solomon Hikes here two days ago from Docker. And uh, this technology really upended a lot of the previous ones. And what's interesting is that there's no single part of Docker that was entirely new. He took different technologies that were actually already out there or being used in different ways but sometimes just combining things together and making a real user interface around it and marketing it uh, actually does change the world. And there's an analogy I used to uh, Tim Berners-Lee in the World Wide Web, where if you look at the components of HTTP is basically like FTP and HTML is kind of like XML and URIs aren't actually all that new, and yet somehow the magic of those three together created the web. And so similarly, Docker has a really revolutionized software development. I think uh, the vast majority of you are either already using it or considering it, but this idea that you can create an exact development environment. And in my last startup, uh, we used to spend so much time and have this long instruction manual for a new developer coming on board, and they would get their Mac or their, their Linux machine, and they would follow through all of these steps of the package manager of installing everything. And at the end, they would hit some bug, and there'd be some command line that or some uh, dependency that had changed from when the uh, instructions had been updated a few weeks ago. And so this concept of immutability, of being able to create an environment and then being able to reliably share it between machines. And so uh, I'd say that Docker has had the fastest uptake of a developer technology ever, um, but has only in the last, uh, more recently, have folks started figuring out how to run that, those Docker containers in production. 
And so that brings us up to the present of what we call cloud native technology. And we define that as having uh, three key components to it. So you have uh, microservices where you divide your application up into multiple different parts. Uh, you package each of those parts into a container and then you use a tool like Kubernetes to dynamically orchestrate those containers in order to optimize your resource utilization. And that's basically to save costs by using the smallest number of machines possible that can fully meet your, your requirements. And part of the, the magic of that microservices is that you no longer need to be locked into one operating system or programming language or platform for your application, but you can divide it up and have optimize each part based on its requirements or what that part of your development team wants to use and have those different parts communicate each other with each other. Okay, so now let's uh, sort of look back on that tour and say, what have we learned? What's been the progress? So the core building block of applications has gone from servers to virtual machines to build packs to containers. The isolation unit went from heavier to lighter weight. The container shares the operating system between the different versions of it. It's, that's both in spin-up time and in size. There's this concept of immutability, that instead of each server being totally custom, that you're uh, configuring it just for that use, that it's more like cattle, that it's mass-produced and, and dealt with. And then uh, the provider has gone from closed source, single vendor, to open source, available for many different vendors, or that you can just download and, and work with yourself. And um, just a quick mention of PaaS, because um, we do think that there's just a ton that uh, people have gained from PaaS. But what's interesting is that several CNCF members have act are actually building PaaSs on top of Kubernetes and other cloud-native uh, orchestration platforms. And so the idea is that many applications actually start out as 12-factor, but then sometimes they outgrow that paradigm. And so what's nice is the ability to have those guide rails when you need them, but then when you need more power to be able to break out of that and to uh, grow into a slightly more complex model. And so PaaS on top of Cloud Native supports both. Okay, so uh, what's the advantage of this? The first one I want to emphasize is isolation. This is um, the, the familiar Docker whale logo talking about different whales of the world. And um, the, the sort of magic of Docker is that dev prod parity. You get your entire environment working in development, you freeze that image, and you can now copy it and push it up to production and move it around and replicate it, and you're getting exactly the same thing. And that fosters code and component reuse, and it can just dramatically simplify operations. Uh, next one is lock-in, that the value of open source software, which is, I think, one of the biggest messages of LinuxCon and ContainerCon, is that uh, it means that you're no longer locked into a single vendor. So there's multiple different vendors that can support you, that you are no longer locked into a single public cloud or private cloud. You can use the one you want to. You can move between them. And also, uh, interestingly now, you can use them in combination. And so that's um, a functionality that folks are increasingly looking at. Uh, unlimited scalability. So. Uh, Google has been using container infrastructure for over 10 years. Uh, they have a statistic from two years ago that they launched 2 billion containers per week. That's um, 3,300 per second on average, but of course their peak is much, much higher than that. So the idea is that these um, platforms are optimized for tens of thousands of self-healing multi-tenant nodes. And um, this slide is talking about the value of microservices um, I'll just say the idea is you have these multiple containers and they're communicating to each other, but boy, do I have a lot of respect for these pirates for how much effort it must have been to get these containers onto those rickety little ships. But um, the idea here is that you uh, divide your application up and they can all communicate. And those different containers, uh, maybe you start out with a Rails application and then you cut out the credit card piece and that can be a Python one and then something that's more performant, uh, you can rewrite and go. And so over time, your application can be cut up into different pieces and optimized for that part of your team and for that function. Uh, the efficiency and resource utilization is kind of the 
basis of orchestration. So the idea is that you have these different containers, they, you're defining what the requirements are, and your system is dynamically responding to those requirements and to the needs and the demand auto-scaling. Um, and that both reduces your costs of maintenance and operations, it also just reduces your server costs. And uh, resiliency. And so uh, this is a relatively shocking image of a container ship. Thankfully, no one was uh, killed on this. But individual containers, machines, even data centers can fail, and uh, you can configure your platform, your, your cloud infrastructure, to be able to survive that. So um, that's the kind of basis for what the cloud, our vision for cloud native. The idea for CNCF is that we are not trying to write that software ourselves. We're actually trying to be one of the best platforms for hosting uh, projects out there. And so many of you are probably involved in different open source projects. We um, are interested in hosting those and we're talking to a number of different projects. I'll show you in a second. Um, our view is that with GitHub out there, the role of software foundations has changed. That us just providing a free mailing list or a website or a repo is no longer that interesting to people. That we need to provide a new set of services. And our goal is to be the best place to host cloud native software projects. So the reason that we um, think that projects should come to us, the first bullet point on there is by far the most important, which is that a neutral home for a software project increases contributions. So a project like Prometheus that actually started in SoundCloud, um, but now has committers from CoreOS and uh, Google and Weaveworks and elsewhere. And so that uh, neutral home allows more people or make, makes pe more people comfortable contributing. We have a uh, really august technical oversight committee of top architects, folks like Solomon Hikes from Docker, Ben Heinemann from Mesosphere, Brian Grant from Google, and others. And there's an endorsement. Essentially, they act as gatekeepers. And it's, I do want to emphasize that it's that technical group that accepts in new projects, not our governing board that, that's uh, made up of vendors. We have a, a $15 million, 1,000 node cluster of state-of-the-art Xeon ser uh, servers that is available. And I, I will mention this is actually available to anyone for your own projects um, that you can apply on our website and make use of it. But we provide pr priority access to the projects that we host. Uh, we have an end user board. Um, we have a press relation and analyst relation teams. We provide some cash to improve documentation, which is always a weakness for every project. Um, we don't try and rewrite projects governance process. We just ask them to have one and uh, to have a fair process for dealing with it. Um, we have a full-time staff starting with me that's happy to help them. And we have um, a really great events team, which is actually the same group that put on uh, ContainerCon and LinuxCon here and um, are now helping us put together a set of, we have a worldwide meetup groups. We have uh, a set of road shows that we're going to be doing around the world to kind of spread and evangelize this idea of, of cloud native. And we have a marketing demo where we're showing how all of these different technologies can work together. So um, I guess I will encourage you to take a, a picture uh, of this screen if you want to, uh, just to be able to prove six or 12 months from now um, how bad my prediction capabilities are, because the only thing that I can guarantee you is that all of these projects will not be part of CNCF uh, a year from now. Some of them, um, our technical oversight committee will not approve. Some of them will change their mind and not be interested in pursuing it with them. Some of them, sort of better alternatives will come along or there'll be a merger or some sort of competition. But I think that this list is still useful because it gives something of a concept of the kinds of projects that we're looking at and the kinds of spaces that we're exploring. We're not trying to do our own Linux distribution. We're not trying to go uh, super low level to firmware or, or anything. But we are um, interested in a, a cloud database, for example, uh, CockroachDB, which is um, something of an open source implementation of Google Spanner uh, messaging. Uh, NATS is a, a, a neat kind of competitor, sort of more modern competitor for, for RabbitMQ and a, a lot of other 
um, ones. And uh, I'll even give you the heads up that I think open tracing uh, next week is probably going to be the third project that uh, gets incorporated into CNCF and that we're very uh, excited to have that happen. So um, this is a little bit of a view into our future. Our goal is that we do have a number of uh, new projects um, that kind of fit together. There's no expectation that end users need to use all of these projects. The idea is that we provide an open source stack that uh, users can make use of, that we know that these work well together, but that users are also welcome to just pull out specific pieces of or replace any given component with their own version or a proprietary one or a competitive project. And um, finally, I would just ask uh, all of you to please uh, consider getting involved. So um, our projects are always in need of new committers, uh, bug fixes, new users. Uh, we have a set of meetups around the world that you can go to our website and, and see and learn more about uh, Cloud Native, Kubernetes, Prometheus, the other ones. We're going to be doing these road shows. They're going to be targeted to a slightly less technical audience than this one, but maybe for some of your colleagues who are just getting started in this space. But our, our goal is to actually uh, have those go around the world. Um, I certainly would encourage you as you're looking at the next versions of applications that you're deploying in your companies to be thinking about a cloud native platform of orchestrated containers of microservices. I think for many legacy applications, uh, running them inside of a VM makes a lot more sense and, and maintaining that is a much easier thing to do, but for that next version of it or when you do update it, uh, moving to a containerized microservices uh, platform is uh, is uh, really the future. And then uh, I certainly would uh, would ask you to, to consider joining uh, CNCF both as a vendor and we have, um, next week we're gonna be announcing a much lower cost uh, end user membership as a way of um, participating and tracking our progress. And then finally, I just wanna give a call out um, our big uh, event, in fact, uh, uh, our first big event is uh, in Seattle on November 8th and 9th, and this is, um, has an even longer name than this event here, Cloud Native Con, KubeCon, Prometheus Day, and uh, we're expecting to sell out uh, at about 1,000 people, so if you're interested, I definitely would encourage you to uh, take a look, and uh, we have the uh, pretty amazing list of speakers on there. And then uh, we will be in Europe in April of 2017. And uh, we'll hopefully have some details on that in the next few weeks. And so if you can't make it uh, over to America, would definitely love to see you at our event um, back in Europe in, before in another six months. Um, and please uh, feel free to reach out to me. I'm uh, very happy. I'll also be here uh, afterwards and uh, I've really enjoyed the hallway track of this event, but um, please feel free to email me or uh, reach me on Twitter, and we have a good amount of information on our website to, uh, to find out more about the project. So thank you all very much.